Hey guys, welcome to week two of our um, lesson for theory of knowledge and we're about to start in motion. Just um, a couple of things that I just wanted to make sure we're clear with you before we move from sense perception. Um, the first thing that we, one of the things we looked at was about Plato's cave and I just when I was reading some of your responses for your journals, I thought that perhaps you hadn't quite fully understood what um, perhaps the meaning behind that was. So I just want to clarify that for you. And that was the idea that um, if we are saying that we can rely solely, only on our sense perception to gain an understanding of the world, what Plato was suggesting, or one of the interpretations of it, is that we can only gain um, understanding of the world that we experience ourselves. And therefore, we're very limited in the knowledge that we can gain because it's only what we can access, what we can see, and what we can experience. And sometimes that might be determined by other people, you know, by authorities or people um, other than um, ourselves. So that was the first point, just making that really clear. The other point was um, the awareness test, where you had to look, um, you know, look out for the number of people that were passing the ball. And, um, and then there was this moonwalking bear that came in the middle of it. Now, um, many of you sit stated quite correctly that you know you didn't see the moonwalking bear because you were looking for the passes and that's absolutely right some people said um, they did see the moonwalking bear because they were had seen something similar to that before and that was absolutely fine but what i wanted you to then take it to the next stage and think beyond the, the idea and the notion of the moonwalking bear but the idea the very idea that we when we are looking for something when we are when our attention is focused so when you're focusing on trying to count how many balls are being passed by the people in white you don't notice other things so for example you didn't notice that the there was a moon walking bear just as an example um, likewise if you are looking for something um, and a couple of you wrote oh you know I was looking for something I knew that there would be a trick and so I was looking for what that trick might be and some of you were able to see the moon walking bear and some of you weren't able to see the moon walking bear. And those people who didn't see the moon walking bear is because you were looking for another trick or something else. And so again, it's about where your attention is focused. So basically our sense perception is only, um, you know, can only be trusted to a degree where, you know, where, you know, if we're focusing on that particular knowledge. And there's just one more point I wanted to make, and that was about the activity where you had the words which were all jumbled up apart from the first and last letter. And again, the main point of that is, is that our brains fill the gaps. So our brain has a, you know, is very clever and is capable to fill the gaps and so therefore and again it's about those therefores what is the implication of this the implication of this is that we can't always trust what we see because maybe our brain has filled a gap and so what we believe we see we're not actually seeing so three really key points are that I wanted you to sort of walk away with last lesson um, some of you did some of you perhaps not so much so the first one is that if we are trusting, only trusting our um, sense perception, then it's only our own experiences and what other people allow us to see. The second thing is um, the idea that it's only where our attention is focused. That is what we will see. That's the knowledge that we will gain. 
And then the last piece is about the fact that our brains fill the gaps. And so we're never really quite sure if what we see is what we are seeing or what our brain is interpreting for us. So there just a few little clarifications there. Okay, so this is an overview of what we're going to be doing um, for um, this, this next section. So we looked at sense, sense perception and now we're moving on to emotion. And today's lesson we're going to look at um, just an introduction. So <clears throat> first of all then, um, it's important for us to note that our direct experience of the world, um, other than through sense perception, of course, um, is through our emotions. And our, emotion, our emotions accompany us throughout our lives so thoroughly and profoundly that it may be difficult for us to consider our sense perception and our ideas <clears throat> without their interconnected emotions. The first thing I'd like you to do is pause the um, recording now and I just would like you to write in your OneNote your definition of the word emotion. So just pause that now, please. OK, great. So what we're going to do now, I'd like you to um, look at your definition. We're just going to hear um, or look at, see a couple of definitions. And I'd like you just to highlight any of the words that you had in your definition that you see. Um, you know, you can highlight it in yellow. And any words that you didn't hear, I would just like to add underneath because it is quite difficult to define. I'm sure that you found that. Um, so the first thing that's interesting is that the word emotion, um, as derived from the, is derived from the, the Latin verb movera, which means to move. And in fact, the, the other word which comes from the same word is motivation. So emotion and motivation both come from the same word. Um, it, um, so it refers to things such as feelings, passions, moods, and all of these can be intuitive or instinctive. So things that just happen without us thinking about it or intuitive as in like they can be really obvious. So any of those words, um, an emotion consists of various internal feelings and external forms of behaviour which we can see and these can vary in intensity. So three quite long parts of a the definition there but any of those, you can add any of those words, highlight any ones that you had in yours. So emotions then can be activated by external causes. So for example, if a lion's chasing you, the chances are you'd be pretty afraid. Um, there may also be internal causes. So for example, you may wake up feeling sad and you're not really sure why. Um, there's actually no exact universally agreed upon definition for emotion or how emotions might be categorised. And in fact, there's not even an agreement about the boundaries between when an emotion is a feeling or when it's a mood. You know, when does it become a feeling? When does it become a mood? When does it become an emotion? However, we can assert very strongly that emotions are the reactions or responses related to sense perception, internal states, thoughts or beliefs about things or people, real or imagined. <clears throat> um, so the word passion is usually reserved for a very strong emotion, like for example, you know, he went into a passionate rage, but you might not necessarily say I was passionately bored, for example. Um, a mood, I think we can say, is an emotion that lasts for a period of time. So it could be a day, you know, a few hours, um, but that's, you know, there's your mood. And emotions have traditionally been seen as more like of an obstacle to knowledge. We normally tend to see them quite negatively. Um, quite often we talk about um, 
the idea of, you know, you would never, you, you know, someone might be criticised for being over emotional, but you may not necessarily ever be accused of being, oh, you're so rational, like you would never hear that negatively, but emotional is often inferred as being quite a negative thing. Um, however, you know, regardless of how we see our knowledge and see our emotions, I mean, um, at the same time, they do matter to us a great deal. And we often use them when we are making decisions. So we often do reflect. So reflection is something that we, of, we often link to our emotions. And um, some people may even say that our feelings um might be a better guide to truth than, than even reason and that might be that gut instinct you know that gut feeling that we have so this is probably a good time for us just to talk about your journal entries for this week so for this week i have um given you two shorter entries to do um, so one is to what extent do you think we're able to control our emotions? Are some emotions easier to control than others? And then part B is imagine a world without emotions. So how do emotions contribute to our experiences of the world, either positively or negatively? And what you will find in the one note, so you just need to write 250 words for each. And please make sure you put those in your um, your journal page. Um, I have put in also in the one note, just a little bit further down actually, um, a couple of links for you, um, just for you to watch, just a couple of little movie, mini movie clips, um, just to give you some stimulus if you like, some ideas. So um, Equilibrium um, was made in 2002, probably way before you were born, uh, a year before you were born, I think, maybe a couple of years before you were born. Um, and this is a world where um, emotions have been banned, like they're, they're completely illegal um, to feel anything. And so this little section of the movie I've put is from um, the father, who's like the leader of the um, this new world, this sort of dystopian world. Um, he explains why emotions are banned so you can watch that and that might give you some ideas um and some of you may know star trek um i know i grew up with star trek um and spock dr spock he was the guy who um the vulcan part actually he was part vulcan part human and the vulcans were known that emotions should be controlled and that they were seen as a weakness and so again there's a little um clip there about how when he believes his emotions have been compromised so again you can watch that and that might give you some ideas um, of what to write okay so um according to psychologists they say that there are six basic emotions and these are happiness sadness fear anger surprise and disgust and they believe that it doesn't matter which culture you're from where you live in the world that you will recognize easily recognize these emotions these facial expressions um, if you see them so these are the primary emotions that everybody has and on your one note you will find um, six pictures of some rather interesting faces there um these are these one each one of these shows the typical facial expression and what i'd like you to do you can pause it in a second i'll go i'll flip back so you can have a look at the six what the six primary emotions were again and i just want you to write what those six primary emotions are you know attach them to the the people on your one note so you can pause it now Okay, so hopefully um, <laughs> you were able to work out um, what they were. So I've got down this this lady here looks like looks disgust here. This looks pretty angry. 
Um, this one looks surprised. This one looks afraid, happy, and probably pretty sad. And I'm sure that all of you will have got that one. Okay, so um, the, these ones are a little bit different again. So these are our secondary emotions. And these ones are um, can be changed and can be a little bit different depending on the culture or perhaps even a certain point in time in a certain era you know a certain century um where you live um, and what you know what your the, your like societal expectations are and um, a good example of this actually is um i used to live in the united arab emirates and in the united arab emirates there very much their culture and whether it's arabic culture i'm not sure but certainly the culture of the emiratis is very much based around honor and pride and it's um really very much about um bringing honor to your family and um not bringing you know shame um, or dishonor to your family and whereas in um, Western culture, we often talk about innocence and guilt. So we always, everything is based around, um, you know, that the idea of that shame and, and guilt, if you like. So that means that we are more ready within our Western culture. We might have feel that idea or sense of guilt, and when we feel guilty, it's perhaps a stronger emotion than perhaps um, someone from another culture. So, um, so these are just some ideas there. Um, certainly, if I go into like go to Thailand, I used to live in Thailand as well, and I the the that emotion of gratitude was very very strong in their culture. So, and they did that through, um, you know, through their Buddhist faith when they would go to the um, the spirit houses um, in each building each morning and would give offerings and show their gratitude so different um different cultures um may have different ways of showing these there may be some cultures that would frown upon some of these emotions and so therefore they we put them aside and we don't you know don't don't show those too much because that's not seen as being um, a good thing so um, for example in a collectivist culture like China for example where they believe not in the individual but in the collective perhaps ambition is not a an emotion that you would demonstrate publicly it might be something you feel but it would not be something that you would demonstrate publicly so it'd be interesting i'd love to see on your one note if you have got any ideas or particularly those of you who do have lived in other countries or come from another country if you've got or have a you know, different nationality or different connection with another country if you can share any of those on your one note i'd love to hear um, what you have to think about that that would be really interesting um okay and then we've got these like background emotions and these are ones that are are um not conscious we're not aware of them um we might be very much aware if we feel um you know if we're feeling uh um what was i gonna say now what was, what was i saying before um you know if we're feeling jealous for example we might be very very much aware of that um feeling uh you know um jealous however here these ones are more um a sort of like a context for our behavior so that kind of you know do we have that general feeling of well-being or that general feeling of you know discomfort you're not quite sure you have a bad feeling about something you may be feeling calm or tense um Oh, I don't think you'd be able to hear any of those actually. Um, you may be feeling calm or tense. Um, you may be feeling weary or energetic. You may have that kind of a bit of a concern or um, a bit of a dread about something, or you might be really excited about something, that kind of anticipation. Um, 
Okay, something else for you is the idea that our emotions are closely connected with our bodies. So, for example, when you feel nervous about an upcoming exam, remember all these times when you're feeling um, nervous, you know, you feel like your mouth feels really dry, you need a drink, you have that sinking feeling, you might feel like you need to go to the bathroom, um, all those physical things that go with feeling nervous. Um, then, you know, if you're feeling excited about something, you know, you may have this kind of like butterflies in your stomach. You may feel like you can't stop smiling, can't stop grinning. You may feel like you've got a bit of a spring in your step. Um, those are um, ways that our emotions are closely connected with our bodies. And what I'd like you to do is write, pause the, um, the recording and just write another example in your OneNote of a time where you can see that your emotions have been closely connected with your body. Okay, so I love this cartoon. Have a good read of that cartoon. Um, the idea with the James Lang theory then is that if we, are, if we agree that our emotions are essentially physical, that, you know, when we're excited, we jump up and down and that we, we move with our bodies. Um, the James Lang theory states that um, the bodily changes come before our emotion. So he says we start jumping up and down, we start feeling our palms start feeling sweaty, um, before you before the feeling before the emotion and so therefore he claims that it's the physical changes that cause our emotional changes and of course this might suggest that we can have more control over our emotions if we can control our body then we can control our emotions um, and one one thing i'd love you to have a go at doing now is pause and I'd like you to stand up <clears throat> don't pause yet listen to what I have to say first of course stand up throw your arms um out as though you're you know making a cross and look up and it is really hard not to smile and it just sometimes um, I do that just kind of stand like that when I just feel I need to um, cheer myself up because sometimes when I'm slumped all over my my um, laptop I start to feel a bit low and a bit you know and it's because I'm sitting like that so perhaps it's true who knows okay finally our last little section here and this is the idea that our emotions can be affected by our beliefs so the issue with the James Lang theory is that our emotions also have that kind of mental aspect to it it's not just about our physical body so <clears throat> it is then widely believed that there's a, like this two way relationship and that our beliefs, you know, our emotions affect our beliefs, but also our beliefs can affect our emotions. And I think it's really important to just clarify here that when we talk about a belief in theory of knowledge, we're not just talking about our faith. So when we talk about a belief, a belief is a conviction or a knowledge claim that we hold to be true. So it's a belief is something that we believe to be true. It doesn't matter whether it's being justified, it's just a belief, it's just a, a, a conviction that we have, regardless of whether it's true or not. So for example, um, I've got some, got some here, that if you, if you have the belief that Iran is producing nuclear weapons, that will incite a certain feeling or a certain um, emotion. Um, another one, you know, that you believe that COVID-19 will infect 80% of the population and will kill 20% or whatever. Like if you hear that schools are opening again and, you know, everybody's going to go back to normal, if you have that belief, that is going to incite quite a big anxiety and um, fear. Um, similarly, if you believe that you saw a snake in the garage, then you're going to be pretty scared to go in the garage. 
Um, of course, if you find out that you're having lunch at Hungry Jack's and you believe that burgers are better at Hungry Jack's, then you're going to be pretty excited about going to Hungry Jack's. So what you can do now is um, the first thing I'd like you to do is write this definition of belief. So you can just copy this definition into your OneNote. So well done to those of you who are listening to the uh, the recordings because you're getting all the answers. Um, and what I'd like you to do um, now is think about, can you think of a belief that you might have? Um, and it doesn't have to, you know, there's going to be no judgment on it whatsoever. But any belief that you might have, or you could put in a hypothetical belief if you want, and how that might incite a certain feeling. So, for example, you might write down, um, okay, I'm going to... You know, my belief is that, you know, Trump is a nutcase, you know. So, therefore, when I hear Trump um, make announcements about something, you know, I'm sure you can think of an example um, that really makes me worried. Or it might be, you know, I think Trump is, um, an inc you know, uh, incredibly amazed and impressed by him so but you know i believe that he's a good person and so therefore every time i hear him speak i feel inspired you know just as an example so any any kind of belief that you have and consider that what think of a scenario um, and what emotion that might bring around so that does actually bring us to the end of our um our recording and our lesson and all you need to do now is just um, work on your journal entries so just quite pretty simple ones this time because we're just right at the beginning of emotion and um, please make sure that you upload all your work on your class notes section of your OneNote and um, don't forget to keep on top of your journal entries so um, I don't want to be emailing people um, reminding them of getting their work done so I'd really appreciate it if you get that done okay take care bye bye